Nita, be nice to do hockey. He's a big timer. And now, ladies and gentlemen, I want you to meet our new star. Try to find a way to make you care. I got my heart your way. You're so shame. What can I say? You're doing. Getting it right with you. I got the kind of love that you expect. My kiss is heavy. Mm. Takes effect. Nothing I wouldn't do. Getting it right with you. Come on, you. Come on, me. Can't you see you're too slow? Why wait anymore? Let us dance, let us sing, let us swing, let us go. Get out the world, do 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 do. Within my arms is right where you belong, and with a love like mine, you can't go wrong. I'll live my whole life through getting it right with you. to see all of you here tonight and uh, may I introduce you to the reason for this Nancy Haver from Elmhurst, Massachusetts. <laughs> If it hadn't have been for you, we wouldn't have this book. Is the book good, ladies and gentlemen? Well, I'll tell you what. Let's just sit back here. Oh, come on. I have to get my notes. Okay. We don't need a mic. Can you hear me? Yeah. Okay. What I want to tell you, ladies and gentlemen, if I may, is how we met, which is a fairy tale in itself. <laughs> uh, my phone rang one evening about, when was it, about six or seven months? It, it was about a year ago. A year ago now. It was the first now. day of spring. Yeah. So, oh, spring is here to stay. Anyway, <laughs> my phone rang, and I answered, <clears throat> and the voice said, are you Jenny Lagon? And I said, yes, I am. <laughs> and she said, well, I have wanted to do tap dancing all my life. And I'm <coughs> years old now, and I'm, <laughs> I'm taking tap, and my teacher.
preacher knows about you. And she said, I'd like to know if I could send you something that I want to do about you. And I said, well, I had no idea what she meant. But you know, if somebody offers you something, don't you say yes? So I did. And the thing that happened was she sent me those beautiful pictures on the back wall there, the three on the left-hand side of myself and myself in Alibaba Goes to Town, one of the movies that I made with uh, uh, Eddie Cantor and just Bill and I together. <clears throat> and uh, when I received them, I was so surprised. And she also sent me some little cards that we, I forgot to bring to show you today of the different tap dancers throughout the country. The Nicholas Brothers and, uh, oh, you know who they are, I can't remember right now. <clears throat> so anyway, the long and short of it was that about, oh, maybe three months or four later, I get uh, the, those pictures in, no, no, a whole year ago, that's right. And that's how it started, that she called me and asked me if she could send these wonderful things to me. So what happened is last September, I danced for uh, the uh, Hastings, the Vancouver uh, the Dance Society, and she came here, and she was supposed to come and take my class on Friday, Saturday, and Sunday, but she was couldn't get here on account of it was New Orleans time, and you know what I mean. And uh, she couldn't get a plane in, so she came on Sunday. So I think it was Wednesday or Thursday the next week, she called me and she says, I want to write a book about you. And I said, what? And she says, I want to write a book about you. I said, well, I'm writing one about myself. It's called, it's going to be called something, I don't know. <laughs> oh, get up. I'm with the show girl. That's what she said. And she says, well, this would be different. So I said, yes. So about a week later, I received the book. So Not I said, a week. Week. Oh, it was a little longer than a okay. week. So it would say two weeks and a half. <laughs> I received the book, and I sat there, and I cried and cried and cried, because I thought I had never in my life seen anything more beautiful, and especially something that referred to you. It was just simply wonderful. So that's why we are here this afternoon, this evening, and tonight and tomorrow. And I want you to give her wonderful applause. Come on. Okay, now you talk about yourself. Thank you. <laughs> okay. Um, the way this came about for me was that I started taking tap dance lessons about five years ago in my mid-40s. <laughs> and um, at our class, the teacher showed lots of footage of old tap, not old tappers, tappers from history. <laughs> <laughs> and inc including Dr. Jenny Lagan. And um, I became so interested in their personal histories. So suddenly I found myself watching tap dancers reading about tap dancers, thinking about tap dancing, and trying to contain myself in every conversation so that I wouldn't talk about it all the time. <laughs> um, but actually doing it was pretty hard. So, um, and progress is pretty slow for me in dancing. So I thought, well, the way for me to participate is to do artwork of the tap dancers. And I, I started with woodcuts, like the ones you see up on the wall I did this was the Nicholas Brothers that Jenny mentioned from Stormy Weather. And um, like she said, it was, it was very exciting to actually get together and talk on the phone. I didn't sleep the entire night after I talked with her. I was so excited. And um, I realized that I really wanted to see a person, so I came out to Vancouver. Yes. Well, the whole, it wasn't just after I went home. The whole time I was here, I was thinking, somebody's got to do about a book about this great woman, a, a picture book. So, you know, the wheels were turning. So I did get go home and do it in a very focused way. And um, I guess for me, uh, somebody like me, tap dancing is a huge adventure. You know, I find it, I, you know, I like sitting at my drawing table and walking in the woods, so actually even doing my steps in front of people is a big challenge. <laughs> and making the noise is a very satisfying thing. I like the noise making part of it. <laughs> and doing things with other people. 
So, you know, and also finally mastering those steps that always look impossible at first mm -hmm. is very satisfying. It sort of keeps me going with the dancing. Mm -hmm. um, and I re recently read a quote that I enjoyed that said, dancing is just discovery, discovery, discovery. Mm -hmm. And it really has been for me. And I thank you for that. Thank you. <laughs> so are there any questions? Does anybody want to know something about us that they would like to know? Did you ever get the lessons yes. with Jenny? No, I haven't had those yet. <laughs> what did you say? What'd she say? I, she said, have you given me my lessons yet? Oh, no. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe later tonight. <laughs> Anyone else? Yes. Have you like always like loved dancing, or did you just get into it? As yes, I was dancing when I was about five and a half, six and a half, seven. I really started dancing when I was about seven. How old are you? You said you're nine. Ten. 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 It's a good age. Keep it up. Do you like it? I haven't done it yet. Huh? I want to do it, but I haven't done it. Oh well, don't do that. If you like it, do it. It's wonderful. <laughs> Everybody should do it. Yeah. <laughs> the world would be a better place. Yes, ma'am. You got a question? No. no? <laughs> <laughs> Any others? Yes, sir. Uh, I'd like to ask Nancy uh -huh. how she was able, or what background she has, in order to draw upon to make these uh -huh. paintings. Because some of them, as she said, are similar to scenes in the movies, right. but some of them are not. I mean, when you were a, a small child and you're learning how to dance and you're teaching kids to dance, I mean, and you told me yourself that th these were very real to you, that the scenes looked like they'd been drawn from life. And I want to know how Nancy knew about this. How did she get that? Uh, well, I, I did use, um, I have a friend, 10-year-old friend, who has several sisters, and I had them pose for me. So I did, but you know, they were wearing jeans and t-shirts uh, and had different hairstyles. So I used them as a way to begin. And then I put in different backgrounds and I changed their clothes. And I was lucky with the guess about the hair. So the, I, I did not do them entirely from my imagination. I see. Yes. Could you, I was wondering if Nancy had ever done books before. Is this have you put together other picture books? Um, I, I did do another picture book, but my specialty is scientific illustration. So all my, all my books have been anatomy books and science books and bird books and animal books and things like that. So this is a very different thing. So the tap dancing has been very inspiring for me. And my parents say, this is the best thing you've ever done. <laughs> <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, yes. Just wondering about your artistic background. Are you, uh, is this a hobby that you developed in your work? Or did, did you go to art school? You're a classically trained artist or? I, I did, yeah, I was fairly focused um, on the art stuff from an early, fairly early age, yeah. So I, I did go to school for that. Mm -hmm. Yes. Jenny, could you tell us a little bit about um, your TAP training? <coughs> Most of us who've uh, taken TAP, uh, we learn in a studio, um, you have a teacher, mm -hmm. and nowadays you, you can even now, uh, you don't even need a teacher, you can, there are videos that teach you how to do that, or you can have books. But I believe your training was not in a studio. Um, your well, training I really, I tell you what, how I trained. When I was about, um, uh, let's see, I think I was 13, no, I was about 10 or 11 years old, and uh, I fell ill. And <clears throat> my doctor, my family doctor, told my mom that I should go down to the south and lie in the sun because I had what they used to call eczema, and that it would cure me. And my, my sister's friend had her, her husband work for people who came from Chicago, where I was born, down south every year. And this was in the winter time. So she suggested that she could take me down and stay with her people because that's where she lived. So I went down there and uh, I was going to school and I thought I would like to be a um, gym teacher because I like sports and all that sort of thing. So when I got there, I had been dancing a bit, but not an awful lot. They had the kids in the Savannah, Georgia, it, at, at, at the time, I stayed down until school was out. And at that time, 
on the east side and the west side, the kids would have a competition and you'd get money for it, the winner. And when they found out that I could dance, they asked me if I would, uh, would represent them. I was living on the, on the west side, so I did that. I won. And um, I didn't know I could dance that well, so when I got home, I said, maybe this is not what I'm supposed to do. And at that time, ladies and gentlemen, the Cotton Club was very, very famous, and they had Sunday broadcasts. And for five months, for six months rather, Duke Ellington was on, and then another six months was Cab Calloway. And when they finished their times, each one came through Chicago with a show, and they always had the tappers on. It was either girls or boys or a mix and all that sort of business. So as I said, I was about about ten year ten years old. I used to did school. Don't understand. <laughs> I used to did school and take my lunch money and go to see these shows. And then I would go up in the balcony and practice what I had seen. So I used to, that's how I really learned to dance. And the one time I went to school, I went to a wonderful teacher there. And uh, I thought I was going to get a scholarship and didn't pan. And unfortunately, my parents didn't have enough money to send me on a regular basis. So I really went, just stuck my head in the, in, the, in the theater and learned how to do it and turn all the steps upside down so that they would never recognize it if they ever saw me dance. <laughs> and one of the most wonderful things that happened to me was the four step brothers. I'm sure you've heard of them if you're dancers and you know them. <clears throat> They were making an audition in Chicago one time, and uh, I had also been in a show that had made me wear the pants. I went to an audition for a course line for Christmas time, and um, the gentleman picked eight of us, and he sent us backstage to try on the costumes. And uh, all these other little girls had good figures, and I hadn't bloomed at all, you know, so I didn't have any hips and no ha-ha, uh -huh, no ha-ha. Uh -huh. <laughs> so, the guys, when we came back on the stage, the, the bra was hanging down and everything was all wrong. So I have always had a big mouth, so I said, I don't dance and things like that anyway, I dance in pants. And he says, oh, he says, can you sing? I said, sure I can sing. He said, oh, well, you can be our soubrette. And I said, I didn't know what it was, but I said, yes, anyway. <laughs> and it turned out that I went home, and my, it was, I said this was Christmas time, and I asked my mother to call one of her aunt, one of her sisters, rather, because her son, my, sister, my auntie's son, was going to get a new, brand new black suit for, for wearing to church. And his old one was going to go down to his little brother. So I asked him if I could have the pants. I got the pants. I got a, had, a, had a cummerbund built. My brothers were waiters with the white jackets, you know, that they used to wear. And my sister's friend cut me one, cut one down for me, and I wore it. And that's how I started dancing in pants. And, that's, and I taught myself mainly. I really didn't have, until I went in course lines and things like that, yes. it's where I learned how to dance. And Swipman sisters are one of the yes. ones I went into. But I believe you showed the Step Brothers some of their own steps. Huh? The Step Brothers? I think you showed them. Oh, some oh, of their, oh, I forgot to tell you that. What happened about the Step Brothers? <laughs> yeah, you, showed, you showed them. Oh, yeah. Day. What happened was they were going into a show and they were rehearsing at the theater. And I was going down to be, to, in, to be, um, to acquire for the job for uh, the Whitman sisters. And they were in one room, and I was early. And I saw them dancing, and I saw they were doing one of the steps that I had stolen from them, see? <laughs> and I was sitting there, and I got <clears throat> kind of antsy, and I said, pardon me, and then, oh, what they were doing was changing, you know, saying, well, take, uh, 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 out, put, pa, 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 and see? So I said, I went up and I said, uh, I, call, I was sitting, they told me I could sit there because I was early. And I said, uh, pardon me, I said, but could you so do something like this? And they said, what do you mean? I said, well, I can show you. So I went up <laughs> and did their step, their step that I had, that I had stolen from, and I had turned it up completely, upside down, and put my own ending on it. And they all stood back and said, look at that little skinny girl. <laughs> and they walked up to me and put their arms around me, and they said, 
go right, we'll take you down to the Whitman sisters. And they took me in and they said <clears throat> to the dance director, you don't have to audition this little chick, just put her in the payroll. <laughs> and that's how I got into really professional because the Whitman sisters were one godsend. They were just fabulous. And Alice, you know, was considered the best tap dancer of her time. She was con with, even with Eleanor and Anne and all the rest of them. And I saw, I used to watch her. I never stole from her, though. I don't think I, I, I could do her stuff anyway. <laughs> but it was a wonderful experience, really. Was she a soloist? Yes. Was she a soloist? Huh? Was she a soloist? Uh, was she a soloist? Yeah. Oh, yes. Uh -huh. She was a star in a show that was called the Whitman Sisters. And the trap, it was an all-black show that traveled the South every year. And at that time, there were about 500 black, all black shows in, the, in the, the South where you could work. And we went out in March, I think it was, or April, when it began to get warm, and traveled all the way from Chicago East and then out down South, all the way across to Los Angeles and then come back this way. And I worked with them. And they had a little boy named uh, Pops Whitman who became Pops and Louie. And they were just wonderful. They were the second best to the Nicholas brothers. Yeah. Yes. Jenny, I understand that a lot of the early tappers actually learned their tap on street corners, picking up on the percussive sounds of, of the streets. Yeah. Uh, was that something? Yeah, we used to dance in the streets. Yeah. We used to dance and challenge one another, and, yeah. and we used to do shows and all that sort of business. Was that done more by? by young boys and men, or did, did you or young women participate? We all in danced. We, we, they didn't, the they didn't, the boys didn't bar us from dancing, because no, no. some of us could out dance them anyway. <laughs> <laughs> no, we had, um, it was just a common thing that happened. The kids, and we had gangs, yeah. but they were dance gangs in my day, yeah. not, not gang gangs, you know, not this vicious stuff that's been going on. Yes. I had a question. We saw some of those film clips earlier, and yeah. we saw Eddie Cantor in uh, blackface. Uh -huh. Uh -huh. And I was wondering, what was the attitude of uh, the black performers of the time towards a guy like Cantor who was making a living doing yeah. blackface? Was yeah. it resentment? Well, he or? and Al Jolson did it too, you know. Yeah. Well, I tell you, it was. Um, I really don't know because I was much younger at the time. At first, when it first started, and I didn't have any. I wasn't on this thing of knowing in and outs and whys and how comes. But um, they were both, both of them were not the kind of people that had all these prejudices themselves. And it was just, a, it was something that he did and he did well. And I don't, I don't think, if I remember right, I don't think anybody protested about it because it was just one of those things that, in, 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 how would you say, made his stuff much better as you can see on the show there. And you see he had all of us working with him. That's why I was wondering, yeah. <laughs> so it was one of those things. No, it was, a, it was kind of touch and go, but not really, yeah. Yes? Did you ever participate in the dance-offs when you were in the Cotton Club in Harlem? No, because I was too young to get in the Cotton Club, and I never went up there, oh, so I didn't okay. see it. But I danced in other places. We used to dance in, uh, in, this, in Chicago in the, in the, on the, on the uh, streets and in, the, in little in private places to dance, you know? Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. Um, in the last 10, 15 years, there's been a major tap resurgence. And you've been one of the main people that have been traveling to the camps and mm -hmm. watching the kids and working with them. So you've gotten to work with them. You've seen how they danced. Um, if you could give a message to the younger generation of dancers from what you've seen about how they perform, what message would you give? I would tell them to learn how to perform to entertain you. I have criticized this, and I understand it was really done <laughs> something. Our new tappers tap across the stage. <laughs> back across the stage. <laughs> and they never look at you. They don't say, they don't dance and say, ha, ha, ha. <laughs> and, you know, to you, because if they're doing this, they're watching their own feet. And you never know what they look like, you see. And they go back, and you never see their faces. So that would be my worst, my main thing, to learn how to perform. Because if you don't perform, if you don't get your audience, what the heck? I mean, you can do all kinds of crazy steps and everything. But if you haven't sold yourself as a performer first, they're just, they just fall out, you know, because people can't, don't know what you're doing. 
They're, you have to be a showman. You've got to learn how to be a showman if you're going to be in the business. And that's for every kind of dancing, not just tap. If you're going to be a, a modern dancer, you want to be able to do that too. So, because, but it's funny for my, my, my thinking about this mo moderns, is there any moderns in here? <laughs> <laughs> is they always suffer. All of, their, <laughs> all of their themes mostly are suffering. But they're such beautiful dancers, but they just... <sighs> <laughs> but they're beautiful. Yes. <laughs> and can you else? continue with your can story with the chorus line? Pardon? Well, if you could just continue you with what you were saying about getting into the chorus line, did that help your career? And tell us more about a chorus line. I don't know any of this. Well, <laughs> what happened when I first got my, I, I, my first professional job after doing the other things that I did was with um, the Count Basie Orchestra when he was brought east to, uh, by uh, the wonderful uh, young man who was in the, in the jazz business. And um, I had heard about Josephine Baker, the wonderful, uh, wonderful of the 20s, the 20s, you know, and a, a friend of hers who had danced with her in the line had told me about how she used to uh, come out in front of the line and do a little bit of nonsense. And so at this rehearsal, I was picked to be one of the 16 girls to work with the, uh, the, the basic co company that, that t at that time. And at one of the rehearsals, we were resting, and uh, I've always been a freshie, so I was up doing nonsense with like Josephine Baker. And uh, <laughs> so they liked it. And the, the, both the, the producer and the choreographer, whose name was Sammy Dyer, were there. And I, didn't, I wasn't paying any attention to that. I was dancing for the girls, you see. And uh, they liked it, and so they had me do the kind of thing that Josephine did. Because she was second on the back line, on the on your right hand, on your left hand side, if you're the audience, on the left hand side, and she would dance with the chorus and do all the things the chorus did. But then she'd take a, a little turn and go out in front and do what we used to call mugging. You know, I mean, she do all these kind of crazy things, <laughs> and that's her. So that's what I, that's the one thing I did steal that I let people know that I could do it. <laughs> yes. Why did you decide to stay in Vancouver? Why? Oh, I love it! <laughs> <laughs> but at the time you came was... Uh, I came Island here in 69. And, yes. And I, and I got here Easter Sunday, 1969. But there was a lot of tapping and dancing around here. Well, the atmosphere. what happened, um, <clears throat> really and truly what happened was that I was, I went, I came down um, Main Street and I came to the um, Pender and upstairs with a club called the Shanghai Junk. Do any of you remember it? <laughs> and uh, I happened to look up at the marquee and on the marquee was the name of <clears throat> a person that I knew very well. And so I decided that I would come back on some, this was on Sunday, and I decided I'd come back that night after I found the hotel and see them, so see him rather. So <clears throat> when I got to the hotel, it was the one that's down here on Pender near Burrard. Its name's been changed 15 times, so I don't remember what it is, but that hotel was the one. And I told the, <clears throat> the uh, clerk to uh, waken me about nine o'clock so I could go over to the club. And he said, oh, he says, oh, we're not all open on Sundays. And I said, oh, my God, where am I? <laughs> 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 I'm in a boondocks, you know? <laughs> so he said, um, well, why don't you wait and go tomorrow? Because, you know, we're open on Monday. And I said, okay. I said, I don't know whether my long green would keep me over Sunday. I only got $1 or $2 or something. Anyway, he said, so I did. And when I got there, not only did I have the young man that I knew as an MC. Uh, I also had two of my ex-students that I had taught dancing to, and they begged me to stay, and they said, they said, what are you going to do? And I was up here with an organization called Jazz Caribe that I had founded and was traveling, and I had, um, it was with the influence of the Belafonte, we did the, uh, we had steel drums, and we also did the, uh, under the pole thing, limbo. and I had a young boy who could go to the limbo, with the Coke bottles that they used to have, remember six inch Cokes? And then he could go under the pole with the fire two, uh, two, two feet off the floor. 
And we had a sensational act that we called the Jazz, jazz Carry. And so I left them in, um, <clears throat> I went to Chicago because I got stranded in New Orleans. And so when I got there, I reformed. And then I went to, I was in a, given a job at uh, Edmonton and Calgary. And I was on my way home from there. And they told me to, to uh, stop and see some um, uh, other people in the theater here. So when I went to the place that night, the next night, they said, don't go, don't go home. You have uh, different talents that some of the teachers here don't have. And would you, would, would want you to stay? So I said, OK. They gave me a uh, place to look for a place to have class. By Thursday, I had a place on Hastings. And I had 20 students when I opened the door on, th on Thursday afternoon. And I ain't gone yet. <laughs> <laughs> yes, let's go now. <laughs> Is there anything else? Yeah. Yes. I'm just going to say, uh, I, I'm Judith Maxey, and huh? I'm a researcher on the National Film Board um, video of Jenny called Living in a Great Big Way. And certainly we spent hours and hours of interviews with Jenny. And, and one of the things that came up quite obviously was naturally this just astonishingly remarkable memory, this ability to, to give out details as if they occurred yesterday. And this wonderful joy and vibrancy and vitality for life. And of course, and that was what, I don't know, Jim, it was back in the late 90s. But as you can see, she still has it. And what she was talking about there in terms of teaching performance, I was thinking at that time, Jim, that one of your secrets is how much you love what you did and what you do and who you are. And I think that if anyone is doing anything, if you love who you are and what you do, you get this remarkable product. So here you have Nancy Haver, who I'm really just reading for the first time this evening. But I know her history through my friendship uh, with Jenny, of course. And uh, Nancy obviously <coughs> loves what she does and who she is. And so when you get this mirroring, this wonderful marriage, there's this remarkable product. <laughs> Anyway, those are my comments. I thank you. We thank you. We thank you. Thank you so much. Uh, <laughs>
Hardly no one's employed And Harlem lives for his Harlem boy There's a boy in Harlem And he writes all the songs Man, man has and belongs to him He laid his fingers down Oh, he won't leave Harlem No coat, no collar, call him Sloppy Joe. He's sizzling He's hot, Joe. watch him blow in his mouth. Go with clothes all sloppy, all, all the ride is copy. This person in the wood pile, oh, he works for pleasure. He works for pleasure, no, no one's 